Let's try to be quick. Ready? Yep. Okay. Hey guys, welcome back to Bible study. Our last chapter. The last one. The last one of Nehemiah. We are all through. So we're in chapter 13 today. And after, um, we actually are recording this on the day of our last meeting as well. So after today, we're going to take the rest of July and August off. Yes. And then we'll have our next study start in the month of September. So we will announce all of those details very soon in, in the Facebook page and then also at church on Sunday mornings. We'll make sure that's included in announcements at some point. But for today, we are going to wrap up Nehemiah chapter 13. And we just finished in chapter 12. This was a very like triumphant chapter. It was a chapter of joy and uh, the people had dedicated themselves to the Lord. And um, now we are chapter 13, 12 years later, and it looks very different. Um, so this is after everything happened in chapter 12, um, Nehemiah went back to work as cupbearer to the king of Persia. So he left and um, came back 12 years later to find that the people were not living, living in the covenant that they had made in the past few chapters. So mm -hmm. um, there are a few examples it gives us of what that looks like. I was going to say... Um... Is it Tobias? Yes. Yeah, Tobias is, is he shows back up in this, <clears throat> um, and he had actually taken up residence. Like, he mm -hmm. started living mm -hmm. in the temple. Mm -hmm. He was one of the noblemen who weren't so noble, um, and he was one of the guys trying to lure Nehemiah away yes. to kill him. So, um, this was not somebody that should have been living in the temple. Our book actually kind of relates him to, like, a... Um, he kind of like is a symbol for idolatry. Mm -hmm. And so basically what's happened is he's he was related to the priest. I think it was the priest. Yes. In the temple at that time. And he kind of snuck his way not only into living in the city with God's people, but living in the temple. Mm -hmm. And um, so that was one way that they had kind of turned away was they were allowing things like that to happen. Another thing was they had stopped observing the Sabbath. So instead of t taking their Sabbath day, they were working at their shops and they were, what did I write in here? They were doing something rather than something. Oh, I don't know where I wrote it. I don't know where I wrote it, but they, they took away the time that was supposed to be set apart for time for them to be in worship and spending time with God. Instead, they were choosing to use that time for themselves to either sell things for their family or to go out and buy things for their family. Um, that's what they were doing instead. And then we also saw... It brings up the... Um, the intercultural... Inter marriage. Marriages. Not, it's not about a race. It's right. anything. It's about... Marrying somebody that is not a Christian, right? Basically, and so these people were doing that. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason that was such an issue is because these people had other gods. Yes. And you know, if we're called to be equally yoked, we can't marry somebody that has other gods. Um, one of the examples it uses was Ruth in the book of Ruth. She's a Moabite woman, and over the course of time, she actually converts into being. A Christian and so then she marries into a Christian or into Christianity yes. um, but that conversion was the difference is there was that process where she became a follower mm -hmm. and these people were not doing that so we saw them stepping away from this covenant they made in those ways and when Nehemiah came back he obviously didn't like what he saw so and surprise surprise he is mostly in prayer for the majority of this chapter he's kind of rebuking what these people are doing and he's doing it with prayer mm -hmm. so he's asking god to guide him through this because it's not easy to hold people accountable in i was your gonna faith. say and i think i can imagine no one like he probably left a day or so after mm -hmm. everything was dedicated and to leave on this high mm -hmm. and to know like how awesome everything is where these people are going where they're headed and then to come, to in come and see back the to the destruction that there was yeah. there, that was there. 
I'm sure that he was like, one, he was probably ticked off. Yeah. And two, if it was me, I'd have been having to pray about what I was going to say. Because right. I was not going to be nice to these people. I mean, like you said, holding people accountable is one thing. But, like, yeah. to know he heard them at their highest high. Yep. To know that they were there and then to see them back at a low. Yep. Which, you know, the wall's still there. But right. the inside of the city was right not what it should have been. It wasn't a set apart people anymore. No. And so I, I imagine he's... Angry. He's probably really frustrated. It feels like all of this hard work was just for nothing. Mm -hmm. um, so when he comes back, he goes through and he's telling people what to do to fix these problems. He's confronting these issues. And then he's also spending time in prayer. He repeats the same prayer three times. Remember me for this, my God, and don't erase the deeds of faithful love I have done for the house of my God and for its services. And um, it talked about that in our, in our book. Um, I wanted to read this. It says, this is not a pompous prayer of a man looking for worldly recognition for his faithfulness. This is a humble prayer of a man who was well aware of his own weakness, but also of the strength and steadfast love of his God. So in these prayers, he's asking God to remain faithful despite mm -hmm. our unfaithfulness yeah. and which God has done in the past. And so he's, you know, that's what he's praying for. Um, let's see what else we have. I was going to say, this was something that I had marked. It was in my mm -hmm. book. I left my book at home. But, um, the back to the start. And if you have the, um, She Reads Truth Bible, it will be in yours as well. Towards, mm -hmm. it'll be the very next to last page of Nehemiah. But it says, sometimes the ancient Israelites remind me of a group of middle schoolers at church camp. God shows them their sin and a new passion is lit within. All sweaty and sunburned, they commit and recommit their lives to obedience and Christian music. Of course, it doesn't last long before that church camp high wears off. They no longer have chapel services twice a day. The songs they sing back at their home church aren't nearly as hip. They aren't eating lunch across the table from their youth pastor. And doggone it, their parents just don't understand. It's a little humorous when we think of the Israelites as middle school campers, but it's a lot less pretty when we see these patterns of disobedience at work in church members, leaders, and ourselves. God had done an awesome thing for Israel. He rebuilt their wall and restored their gates, but not only that, the Israelites were also restored spiritually. They were a city again, brought back from exile and thriving in every way. Many of them must have wondered if they'd ever see this day again, and so they recovenanted Recovenanted, covenanted <laughs> that's all that's all hard to say with god and this time they really did mean it but when nehemiah went back to babylon to serve the king all israel's confessing and campfire songs became a distant memory and they forgot their covenant forgot their god again mm -hmm. why do you think the book of nehemiah ends the way it does with failure and backsliding instead of permanently changed people what does God want us to see about himself and the church? Mm -hmm. Like Israel, we fall over and over again and again. Mm -hmm. Like them, we are weak. We quickly fall back into enticing ways of sin and forget our Heavenly Father and all he has done for us. But when we focus on our inability to remain faithful, we forget the other side. While we, were, while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. Regardless of the number of times we have and will fall back into sin, Jesus' sacrifice still covers it. He will not leave us in darkness. He will continue to do his good work in us. This is our Savior. He never gives up on us. He continues to pursue our hearts and mold them more and more into his image, even when it feels like we've slid back to the start. Praise the Lord that sanctification is a process. Mm -hmm. That's what I remember when we were <coughs> to youth camp and we always talked about how you come back like on fire for God yeah, every time and a, but a lot of people forget that fires have to be fed yep fires go out if they're not fed mm -hmm. and that's part of our relationship with God is it has to be fed when mm -hmm. we come back and we feel even like for me the first time I went through this study like back in January I was on fire for God and it did not take long to fall back into like, oh my gosh, I want to sleep in. I don't want to get up and do my Bible study. I don't want to spend time in prayer today. I've got all this other stuff I've got to do. It just took, it did not take long to fall back into old routines and old habits. We see that in Nehemiah where these people 
yeah, it's 12 years later, but yeah. over the course of those 12 years, they slowly just became who they used to be. Right. And rather than holding on to that covenant, feeding themselves with the word and in prayer, mm -hmm. they became these people that were no longer set apart. Well, and it's kind of like we talked about at the beginning, consistency. Mm -hmm. Consistency in prayer, consistency yeah. in reading our Bible where it's not a have to, mm -hmm. it's a need to. Right. You know, we get into the habit mm -hmm. of we're doing this every day at this time or, you know, mm -hmm. whatever. And when we miss it, it's you desire that. And yes. so we get back into it. So yeah. it's the consistency of staying faithful in, yeah. you know. Even when it's hard. Even when it's hard. I know that can be really hard for... A lot of us who are we're working full time or if you have kids, like it can be daunting to think I have to add something else to my routine. And it is daunting to think that. But I think also give yourself grace. Like for me, I typically know that I'm not going to get to my Bible until after Evie's been taken to school. <laughs> it's just not going to happen. If I want it to be rich and fruitful, Mm -hmm. I've got to get her to school first. So give yourself grace. Don't think it has to be. It's great if you can wake up and first thing in the morning is pull your Bible out. That's awesome. But for me, it's more important that I get my time in the Word mm -hmm. no matter what time of day it is. Sometimes on Sundays, I don't get to do my quiet time until literally like bedtime. I put Evie to bed and then I'll open my Bible. And that's just how life works and it's how it works for me right now. So don't think that you have to follow all these strict guidelines to have this perfect routine. Like it can be messy and still be rich. Well, so. I think we also have to remember we have time for what we make time for. Right. You know, you have time to watch two movies before mm -hmm. you go to bed, but you don't have time to be in your Bible. Yep. And that's, I know that's a hard truth that, well, what about relax? Well, let's relax with Jesus. Yeah. You know, you have time mm -hmm. for what you make time for, whether that be in the morning, whether that be we make time to work out, we make time to watch TV, we make time to do all these things, you know, and I, I'm saying this for myself, holding myself accountable, you know, what about God? When are yeah. we making time for God? Well, he is the, and he is the ultimate rest. Yeah. So if you're looking to rest, mm -hmm. this is the best place right. to be. Yeah. And it's so hard there are times where I'm like sitting in my living room and I'm like falling asleep mm -hmm. I can't keep my eyes open <coughs> it's also a matter of the heart like God sees me trying mm -hmm. God sees me putting in the effort for that relationship he sees me setting apart time to be his set apart people yep. and that is so important and that's how we create that I'll be honest that desire to be in the word is not there if I don't have the discipline to do it first yep that desire has grown with the discipline. Mm -hmm. So, what were our questions? I guess I need to pull those up. Let's see. Okay. How does the book of Nehemiah and chapter 13 in particular point to the importance of God's word in the life of the believer? <laughs> we just talked about it. We just talked about it. I mean, and that was, that's basically it. We make time for what we make time for. Mm -hmm. And you have to have the discipline to have the desire. Yeah. I mean, I think that, and that's basically what I, I wrote down for that, mm -hmm. you know. Yep. I also think um, it says, in, like, the importance of God's word. It doesn't say the importance of a devotional or the yeah. importance of a commentary. It's God's word. So while I do think books like this are awesome, make sure you're opening your Bible. It's the, I wrote down, the Bible is the most honest point of view of God's character that we can ever get. Yeah. So. Okay, the people were prone to forget the covenant that they had made with the Lord and how he had been faithful. So often we are prone to forget the Lord as well. How can we intentionally remember the Lord? <laughs> I think everything in relationships that thrive, there's a lot of intentionality. You have to be intentional with the time that you spend in them, intentional with what you're doing, like the decisions you make. And I think... For, if, if you know that you are someone, I am someone to so easily see a blessing, thank God for it, and move on. Mm -hmm. And then I'll forget, like, all of these things that God's been faithful for. Write them down. You guys have heard me say it over and over. 
write this stuff in your Bible and put a date on it because one day you'll flip back to it and you'll just be amazed at what God had done in that time in your life or what you wrote down two years ago that he's, you know, answering a prayer of today. So I was going to say, I think writing it down is a huge thing. Mm -hmm. We talked about, you know, prayer jars and blessing jars and, you know, there's all these different ways you can do a journal, <clears throat> you can do, you know, whatever. But even the tiniest little thing that, you know, you, you've had in your life is important. Mm -hmm. You know, there's nothing too big, nothing too small for God. And I think writing those things down, whether it be on a tiny slip of paper and mm -hmm. you put it in a jar and you pull it out later or you have notebooks that you write things in mm -hmm. that you go back from time to time, but going back to read those things, yeah. you know, in your Bible, you write stuff down and, you know, I hope five years from now you're still in your Bible. But, um, you know, it's important yeah. to... Not just to write it down and forget about it, but to write it down and go back to it. Yeah. I think um, we can also, you know, the Bible tells us that we can ask the Lord for things. And I think it's, for me, I have found that I've had to ask God to show me where he's being faithful. Mm -hmm. Remind me of where he's being faithful. Um, you know, every single day, God is blessing us and he's being faithful to us just by giving us another day here and um but intentionally praying that god i know you're working and right now it's really hard to see it show me where you're being faithful mm -hmm. because it's it's not always i mean i don't i have never like literally heard the audible voice of god you know it's always been something he's shown me through something else and praying for that is he wants us to show him our need for him yeah and so we can do it that way Okay, last one. The book of Nehemiah ends with another prayer of Nehemiah. We have seen Nehemiah spend extended time in prayer and also prayer in moments of anxiety and fear. How does the prayer life of Nehemiah encourage you to cultivate prayer in your life? We've talked about this before. He had those routine prayers, kind of mm -hmm. like we've got our morning and then our, our lunch prayers and then our bedtime prayers, mm -hmm. but he also had those prayers that he prayed during like times of tragedy and when he felt like there was turmoil or opposition um it wasn't that he only went to God in prayer when it was in his routine but also outside of it and it wasn't just I mean I know a lot of this is because of a need of whether it be you know wisdom or right. discernment or whatever mm -hmm. but like I know if Nehemiah is praying that much about these things, mm -hmm. like going to prayer is not just a, I need something, right. God. It's a, he talks to God like God's his best friend. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to lie, that hurt my feelings just a little bit because I realized as much as I think I talk to God and me and God are best friends, mm -hmm. like I need to be more like Nehemiah. <laughs> yeah. So I think you know realizing that it's not just when we need something or in the hard times that we're praying mm -hmm. but all the time yeah you know and I think it that's what I guess when it is those like times of like there's tumultuous times whenever you're like all of a sudden in mm -hmm. prayer because something has happened yeah. of course we're covering our prayers and our needs but also yeah. taking time to to say I'm praying to God because I know you will be faithful. I know that you're the creator. I right. know that you're the king. And like acknowledge, acknowledging that. We kind of learned that in like, I think it was chapter one, like the aspects of a prayer. Yes. About the, the you know, worship. The worship and, and then the, you know, repentance. Mm -hmm. and, then and then the ask. ask. Yeah. And, and not that your prayers have to be like, no, you know, I mean, they can't be conversation, but acknowledging who you're praying to and why you trust God yes. with your prayers um, I mean, that's, I just imagine it like being words of affirmation for God, like yeah. for us to be telling him that we love him and not just asking for things and assuming he knows that we love him and we trust him, Yeah. but actually intentionally telling him. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, Nehemiah. There you go. That's it. Wow. I will say, and we're, I mean, it was in our book, it said to go back and read yeah. the whole chapter again, and I really encourage you to do that, mm -hmm. and I know that's kind of daunting to go through all 13 chapters again, but 
literally every time, I mean, you think about it, we started reading the whole book and then we dug into each chapter mm -hmm. and we've gotten so much out of it. The two times that we've read it, yeah. read it that third time. And one, it's going to make it stick. Two, there's going to be even more that you get out of it mm -hmm. as you go. Um, I was going to try and find a sentence that summarized what this said. Um, the chapter that does say go back and read the entire book, when it does that, it's focusing on how Nehemiah points to Jesus and how it mm -hmm. points to the gospel. And, um, you know, it says in here, they tried to be holy. They tried to follow the law. They tried, but they always failed because no matter how hard they tried, they could never live up to God's standard. And that try and fail was just a constant need for Jesus. It was a constant mm -hmm. reminder of their need for a savior. Um, so if you do go back and read it, try to figure out how this fits into the gospel. Like what does it, you know, why was this? And we talked about that a little bit in yeah. a few chapters back, but um, I just think it's. Really well, and not just Nehemiah, the Old Testament, mm -hmm. the Bible as a whole is, it's, and I've done a study on it before. It was called Seamless, but the Bible as a whole is seamless. Mm -hmm. It works together and it's not, you can't read it front to back and it be chronological right. or whatever, but as a whole from Genesis all the way to Revelation, it, um, hang on, it's, sorry, I got a low battery. No. I don't think it did anything, but as a whole, it goes pointing to Jesus, the whole right. Bible. Every, yeah. Every book, every chapter, every yeah. verse. And we even talked about the gospel. That, that character in the Bible who, like, laid the stones yeah. for the river that yeah. Jesus was baptized in. Yeah. Like, and there's stuff like that placed throughout the entire gospel. Mm -hmm. Um. So yeah, if you go back through and read it, I would encourage you to look for stuff like that. And say there's little Easter eggs. Yeah, so good. Yep. Yay! This was so fun. It was. I loved it. I can't wait till our next. Time. I know. We will update you guys through the Facebook group, and we'll make announcements on Sunday mornings whenever it's time for all that. Um, we do have a T-shirt for the Arise Bible Study that's coming. We'll have information posted on Facebook this week. Yep. Um, it'll be a pre-order, so you'll pay for it and do your size, and then we'll order them, and then we'll distribute them at either. Uh, we'll, when we see you next, yes. we'll have them on a Sunday morning or something. Yeah, or we can yep. get them to you however yep. we need to. For those of you that I know, there's some that are not local, are not here. Yes, we can. We'll ship them. We'll to ship you them. Or yeah, get them to you. You just let us know. Road trip. Let's go. Let's go. Nehemiah on the road. Yep. <laughs> okay. I think we're good. Anything else? I think so. We're good. Okay. Yay. Bye, guys. Bye.